Hello and welcome to this discussion on circularity in electronics, organised by the European Recycling Industries Confederation. I'm Kira Taylor, a journalist covering energy and environment policy in Brussels. Today, I'll be moderating this discussion as we look at how to implement circularity across the electronics value chain. We'll start with an introductory speech from Giuseppe Piardi, the managing director of Stina Recycling Italy. We'll then move on to a panel discussion with some key players in this industry. There'll be time for Q&A at the end, so please send in your question using the chat function. Please also indicate the speaker to whom your question is addressed. Please also ensure that you keep your camera and your microphone off unless you are the one speaking uh, throughout the sessions so that we can hear all the speakers properly. This event is being recorded, so you can watch it back on Europe's website later. Now, waste electrical and electronic equipment poses a major environmental challenge for the EU as it looks to go towards a circular economy. According to the UN, the world generated an estimated 57.4 million tonnes of e-waste in 2021. In the EU, electrical and electronic equipment is one of the fastest growing waste streams. But according to the Commission's Circular Economy Action Plan, it is estimated that less than 40% of electronic waste is recycled in the EU. This means valuable materials like silver, copper, gold and platinum go to landfill or are incinerated. The European Commission has adopted several initiatives to reshape the electrical and electronic equipment value chain and boost recycling for these products. That includes the Waste, Electronics and Electrical Equipment Directive, which is currently under evaluation, and the Sustainable Products Initiative proposed last year. We'll be looking more into these pieces of legislation over the course of this event. But to start us off, we have Giuseppe Piardi. He is the Managing Director of the Italian branch of Stina Recycling and is well-versed in recycling waste electronics. Mr Piardi, to start us off, you have the floor. Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon everybody, and in particular to the speaker who will speak after me. As uh, <clears throat> I am Giuseppe Piardi and I am the Managing Director of Stena Recycling in Italy. I am particularly grateful to Eric for the opportunity I have to represent the point of view of a company, Stena, that operates in the circular economy sector and uh, in Italy has its core business in the recovery of we and in verticalization of these activities. Recently, just uh, to give an example, we have inaugurated in northern Italy a new plastic recovery plant from plastic coming from we, but not only, which allows us to close the loop starting from the disused E to ensure what make the, uh, them up, ferrous, not ferrous, metals, plastic, Hello? plastic that will bring back to clean polymers and other critical materials. And like us, others company in Italy and uh, in EU are engaged in what has now become a real industry with a new development model that from linear has become circular. In this regard, can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. In this regard, I would like to clear up a misunderstanding. I, uh, it is often said that uh, the poor recovery of we is due to the lack of the plants. This is mostly not true. What is missing is the collection. As the introduction uh, was said, uh, the <clears throat> collection all over the world is 18% of the put on market and in you we are more virtuous but anyway we are around 40-50% of the target. Coming back to the topic I want to affirm here two key principles industry and development. Industry because we recover is now an industry and development because the circular economy industry 
helps a sustainable development and new opportunities. This means that waste become an opportunity, a resource, a new raw material and no longer a problem. So the paradigm is overturned. We note that there is a clear European commitment at a high level, which has based, sorry, which has been based in some format act, like uh, the uh, December 2015, December 2019, March 2020 European Commission uh, application. Today, in my opinion, we must ask ourselves how our everyday work adapts itself to the new contest. And we cannot hide the fact that while much has been done to ensure a contest in which waste recovery take place according to the right to the right principle of safeguarding the environment and the human health, the older but also recent regulatory acts highlight some critical issues. And my contribution to this discussion is to ask some questions that I think deserve to be discussed. Are we doing everything possible to ensure that the implementation of the rules is uniform in all member states? Do, do all operators in different countries have the same rules, the same bureaucratic times, the same controls, the same possibilities? This is a question that we cannot escape because if we if the circular economy of we is an industry, then the principle of a level playing field and free competition must be applied, obviously within the framework of rules that has been placed for the treatment of this waste. Another important question is if collection must increase as is needing. Then for treatment facilities to reach all EU market is a key factor and consequently is needed to harmonize an harmonization of European waste code in all the countries. Is needed a clear and unique definition of when notification is needed and when green list is correct is needed to define a fast timing for notification procedures. On these topics, regulation for export of waste that are ongoing seems more and more tightening the rules without solving the problems. As you see, I'm speaking about uh, topics that are our daily problems. And if we assert that circular economy is an industry, I'm asking prohibition, prohibitionist laws creating ever stricter rules that aim to create a local market for all kinds of waste is the way, means is necessary that in European country, the waste must be treated like in a tight way, it means uh, the circulation of the waste must be under so high level of rules. This is, in my opinion, a mistake because we need to follow the best practice and to help the company to reach the correct uh, level of uh, volume to invest and have a return on it. Isn't it better to create a well-managed market that supports private company interested in investing? Because apart the framework that is needing to have uh, clear rules and to have as much as possible a rules uh, giving us the, uh, the, the certainty that the environmental and health is preserved. 
then it's the private that must invest. And if the, the private will invest, if the market is well managed and regulated. For that, we need, first of all, coming back, a stable and high we collection rate. I remind you that the rules foresee that the producer is responsible for the economic burden of the recovery, while the public sector is responsible for the collection. And sometimes it seems that the, uh, I mean, the public hands is more interesting to regulate how the private is acting than how the public is helping the collection that is still poor. And then uh, is needing also to have uh, incentive uh, for using secondary raw materials in new products. This is something that we discuss from a long time from some procurement in public uh, in public, uh, there are some rules, but I'm sorry, uh, uh, they are not working. What is needing is to better describe and support the use of raw material, secondary raw material in new products, and uh, define clearly what is and the waste and what is not. Now, a lot of country has its own, or better, a lot of permit has its own way to define the end of waste. And this is dangerous for, our, for, uh, for us as, as recycles. But sometimes we are asking, uh, is better to have a common definition or not? Because what is going on for what concerned the export of uh, of uh, uh, waste uh, are not promising if uh, rules are uh, improved also in the end of waste uh, regulation, new rules. So this is my 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 questions, my uh, contribution to this discussion. I think that we as recycles are trying to define our industry and we are an industry and we deserve as all the other industry to have a clear framework on where uh, playing and compete. I thank you for your attention and I hope my speech was clear. Thank you for that. It's really interesting to get the industry take, particularly when it comes to needing uh, conformity across the EU. So next we can turn to our panel who will discuss how to bring circularity into electronics from various perspectives, including uh, from the policymaker perspective and from the industry and NGO perspective. Each panelist will give a, about a 12 minute introduction and then we'll have time for a Q&A discussion at the end. So I'll quickly introduce the whole panel and then we can hear from each of our speakers. So first of all, we have Sarah Mathieu, a member of the European Parliament who sits on the Environment Committee, Benedict Stora, Environmental Sustainability Lead at Samsung Electronics, Maria Banti, a Policy Officer working on the circular economy at the European Commission, Tess Potsy, Institutional Affairs Officer at Derichberg Environment and Chair of the Europe Waste, and Ele Waste Electronics and Electrical Equipment Working Group, and Mature Rana, Program Manager at the Environmental Coalition on Standards. To start us off, we have Sarah Mature. She is a Belgian member of the European Parliament and the Shadow Rapporteur on the proposed regulation on eco designs for sustainable products. Ms. Mature, to give us a perspective from the European Parliament, you have the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, thanks for, uh, for inviting me. Um, one of uh, my main focus points here in the Parliament is really boosting the circular economy. Uh, and I think it can really deliver a triple win geopolitically by reducing our resource dependence, ecologically by reducing our impact on the planet, and of course also social, economically by reshoring all kinds of jobs that we've outsourced uh, in the previous decades. I think we shouldn't forget that a lot of social frustration and economic problems are linked 
uh, to areas and groups of people that are in decline. And the circular economy can really bring more value as it has great potential for economically weak regions and for people with different different skill levels. And I want to briefly address six avenues to increase circularity and specifically recycling of waste, electrical and electronic equipment. Now, uh, in preparing for this talk, uh, I looked up a couple of numbers. So the EU generates about 10 million tons of waste from electrical and electronic equipment. And according to the European Environmental Agency, the recycling rate of electrical and electronic waste was only 39% in 2018, although it's not always clear. Uh, I've seen even lower numbers. So if we put that in perspective, we're landfilling or burning the equivalent of about 600 Eiffel Towers in terms of weight, 600 Eiffel Towers. Another statistic that I really find eye-opening is uh, the collection and the recycling rate of we is actually lower uh, than that of municipal waste, which has a recycling rate of 49%. But uh, the EEA has more uplifting news as well. It commissioned a technical study on the factors that pose problems for recycling, and they really conclude that there's a significant potential to double the recycling rate of both of those waste streams. On the one hand, that's really good news because it means that we can still make big improvements. But on the other hand, the study also clearly shows the limits of recycling, meaning that we can't only rely on it uh, to solve all of our problems. Having said that, uh, let's focus on a few uh, key challenges, uh, specifically on recycling and how I think legislation under the Green Deal can help. So let's uh, talk about collection first. Um, the EEA study suggests really great potential also in this respect. The potential for separate collection of electronic waste for recycling could achieve an additional 4 million tons of additional separate collection and that would mean 75 percent uh, separate collection rates so the circular economy action plan uh, also actually promised to do so and i quote to improve the collection and treatment of waste electrical and electronic equipment including by exploring options for an eu-wide take-back scheme to return or sell back old mobile phones tablets and chargers now, unless I missed it, I haven't seen any legislative proposal in this uh, effect, and I think we should really put that in place as soon as possible, especially for devices containing critical raw materials, take-back schemes, such as, for instance, a deposit refund system that could really make a huge difference, and this and other obligations could really be part of a much stronger extended uh, producer's responsibility. Um, that's, of course, also linked to product design. I think we urgently need better standards for design, for recycling and disassembly. And that's really what we want to do with the new eco-design regulation. The details, uh, they still have to be hashed out in the delegated acts, of course, but I'm quite confident that this will really be a major step forward. And uh, as a negotiator in the ENVI committee, I'm really pushing to include electric and electronic appliances in the first work program uh, to make sure that it will be addressed really quickly. One uh, interesting idea is really to use financial rewards and penalties for companies that do better or worse than others. And the eco-design regulation will create minimum standards, but also a number of performance classes. And through extended producer responsibility and rewards, we could incentivize uh, the producers to go beyond the bare minimum, for example, on recyclability. Uh, a third and a related issue is the problem of substances of concern. Phasing them out and developing standards for recyclables would increase products recyclability and that would lead to a stronger demand in the secondary uh, materials market. And uh, this is also addressed in the eco-design regulation proposal. Uh, the Commission wants to restrict them if they hinder recycling and reuse of materials. And I think that's really great uh, because it allows for a targeted and a quick approach for each product category 
compared to REACH, uh, where uh, that covers, of course, a huge amount of substances. And I know that manufacturers uh, don't want this, but I very much approve. And I would add that we should also restrict substances if they are a threat uh, to human health uh, and to the environment. A first, uh, fourth solution is about creating markets uh, for secondary materials. Um, and one key measure is really to set recycling targets and further in the future, of course, also recycled content targets. Uh, I know that the WE directive has recycling targets for different uh, types of appliances. And while that's good, we also really need targets for specific materials. And the reason is that many critical raw materials or rare earth elements cannot be effectively recovered for various reasons. For instance, because of uh, the low market price that don't cover uh, the recycling costs or because there's a lack of recycling technologies on commercial scale. And of course, sometimes there are just physical limits uh, to recovery. So if we set uh, these targets for the material streams, we will really create a signal that the demand uh, will go up and that it makes sense to invest in those necessary technologies. And if you only keep targets for the products as such, then, well, we mind up just recycling, for instance, the aluminium or the plastics. Uh, that's not good enough. Uh, public procurement, it can also help in creating a market. And again, uh, eco-design regulation will help because it will create mandatory specifications or selection criteria that public authorities will be required to use when they are issuing public contracts. Uh, fifth uh, key issue revolves around the shipment of waste. This happens to be very topical because we've just concluded uh, the negotiating mandate for the Parliament on the waste shipment regulation in the plenary last month. And one key feature that I really fought for is the level playing field for waste facilities, both in and outside of the EU. Because previously, and again, uh, in the Commission proposal, the facilities outside of the EU we're only required to apply broad, broadly equivalent uh, environmentally sound management. And we have instead asked that standards are the same everywhere. And this will be ensured by independent audits that exporters have to carry out in the facilities, backed up by inspections to verify if they are in fact not uh, backsliding. That being said, I think we also need stronger enforcement and market surveillance by the member states. The regulation will help uh, by coordinating member states better, the digitalization of the procedures, and bringing the anti-fraud agency OLAF on board. In my experience, for example, in my home country, Belgium, it's really the member states uh, that should have to step up their game. And then sixth is the issue of a broader nature. I think we will also need sufficient investment, both in terms of capital and of people if we want businesses to increase uh, recycling and circularity more in general. We also want these companies to ensure the highest environmental performances and, of course, worker safety. And that's why I think it's important to include training and reskilling programs for the circular economy really as a priority in the EU skills agenda and in EU funding programs. Or take, for instance, the sovereignty fund that was uh, recently announced by von der Leyen. If we want a resilient Europe that is less dependent on other countries, then the criteria and goals for member states should also prioritize the investments in a circular industrial ecosystem. I leave it at that, uh, and I'll be curious to hear the other speakers and, of course, your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yes, to remind our audience that we will have a Q&A after this. So you have, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please just put them in the chat and I'll try and get through as many as possible after all of our panelists have spoken. Uh, so next up, we have Ben Dickstora. He's the Environmental Sustainability Lead for Samsung Electronics and is responsible for the company's regulatory and industry affairs on waste, resources and chemical issues in Europe. So to look into what Samsung is doing regarding sustainability and eco-design and the company's views on that current legislation that we just heard laid out, Mr. Storer, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Kira. Um, I do have some slides which I will quickly bring up, which hopefully you're all able to see now. 
Um, I will just be diving into things. I've got a lot to get through, I'm afraid. So yeah, I'm Ben. I'm here to talk through uh, what Samsung is currently doing in terms of sustainability, but mainly to talk about uh, eco design and ESPR. So first things first, quick overview of Samsung. We're a global business. Uh, Samsung Group is over 80 years old uh, and Samsung Electronics, uh, part of that group, has been around for over 50 years now. So we have over 220 operation hubs across 80 countries. Um, we are you know, uh, widely affected by a variety of uh, legislation um, uh, across the globe. So uh, again, I'm going to try and rattling through these earlier slides, but this is just to give you an idea of sort of the sustainability goals that Samsung is currently working on. Since our uh, original environmental declaration in uh, 1992, we have implemented environmental management plans and began public publicly reporting on performance uh, in the year 2000. From 2008, um, we have published our sustainability reports. Our 2023 one is due out in the summer, so please do keep an eye out for that. But just to give you an idea of what we're currently aiming um, aiming towards, um, we're looking to hit net zero by uh, um, by 2050 for the whole business. We're looking to get to 100% renew, renew, renewable energy use, uh, both overseas and in, and in Korea. Uh, continue to reduce power consumption, stand by for major products, um, collection of e-waste, so 2021, we collected about just over 5 uh, million tonnes of e-waste. By 2030, we want to get that up to about 7.5 7 tonnes. And we're looking to achieve zero waste to landfill as well at our manufacturing sites. So again here, I'm not going to delve too much into this slide, um, but we pushed ahead with diverse environmental initiatives at different stages of the value chain to minimise our environmental footprint across the entire product life cycle from development to purchasing, manufacturing, distribution, use and disposal. Samsung is introducing circularity into all aspects of our product and packaging design. Um, just an example, uh, in, in 2021 alone, we used 33,000 tonnes of recycled plastic from discarded electronic goods, fishing nets, plastic bottles across a wide range of our products. And it's course, important to note that we're not doing this um, uh, alone. We have been collaborating with um, um, other organisations as well to help achieve um, uh, 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 greater circularity, our greater circularity goals. So. Um, uh, for example, we've been working with the United Nations Environment Programme on Sustainable Development Goals app, Ocean Bound Plastic, uh, worked with partners to develop uh, polyamide re resin made from recycled nylon fishing nets, been working with Patagonia on microfiber reduction technology solutions, uh, carbon trust on carbon footprinting, and, and iFixit, a US partnership uh, to support consumer repair. But what I really want to dive into, and I will dive into now, is talking a bit more about uh, um, eco design and, and the ESPR um, proposal. So first things first, uh, the electronics industry has significant experience of eco design requirements and Samsung more than most with both uh, consumer equipment and digital appliances being part of our, 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 our products. However, while Samsung is broadly supportive of the aims of ESPR, Purely due to the, the, the scope and ambition of ESBR, we need to ensure it's implemented correctly in order to ensure it works efficiently. So my first point here, um, harmonised approach to support the single market. Again, I don't think this is too controversial here, but the move from a directive to a regulation for eco design could ensure obligations will be implemented in a more harmonised way across the EU member states and secure the functioning of the single market. This is something that we strongly support. The EU single market is a key asset for industry and consumers alike. It is critical to implement the ESPR in a way that focuses on keeping markets open and cross-border trade for products flowing. And it is imperative that technical requirements on products should also be harmonised at EU level. In recent years, we have experienced many different national provisions and mandatory requirements on products that are not necessarily aligned with EU requirements. Some key examples on this are uh, microplastic filters for washing machines in France and Luxembourg, 
uh, the Trident sorting logo in France, other national product packaging requirements in Bulgaria, Italy and Spain. And this lack of harmonisation not only increases the burden on industry, but jeopardises EU competitiveness uh, as a whole. Now, it's important to have a consistent approach with other EU legislation and policies. Uh, the ESPR has the potential to establish almost a win-win scenario for both the environment and for European manufacturers. And the ESPR proposal seems a kind of catch-all, bringing together all encompassing eco-design, energy efficiency, labelling, waste, chemical and, and market surveillance legislation. And because of this policy objectives choice um, because of this policy of uh, objectives choices and incentives across all policy areas must be implemented in a clear and consistent fashion to create a market for sustainable circular business models and uh, it would be useful for full consistency between all existing chemical waste safety and market surveillance legislation the requirements for products stemming from ESPR need to be fully harmonised with existing and upcoming EU legislation as well. So we believe we need to build on the experiences of the eco design instrument. So we support that the ESPR continues the good practice of setting product specific eco design requirements via implementing legislation on a product group specific basis to take into account individual characteristics and product specifics, so even within individual um, categories of equipment uh, in our industry, the products and their environmental impacts differ significantly. Product sustainability requirements must be evaluated to ensure um, uh, that they ultimately lead to more sustainable products. Any requirement, whether it be performance or information, must be measurable on the product and designed so that they can be efficiently um, enforced by market surveillance authorities. And point two here, uh, requirements set out at a horizontal or component level do pose a risk of setting double regulation on pro at, um, at product level. Such double legislation impedes the ability of industry players to innovate while increasing the cost of products without necessarily creating any additional environmental benefits. So again, sorry, I'm rattling through this. I have a lot to cover and not much time, so I, I do apologise. Um, but I want to touch on uh, appropriate methodologies for, e, um, for ESPR as well. It, it is essential that we have uh, an indicative methodology to integrate sustainability and circularity aspects. Only indicators and or per parameters that, that are measurable enforceable, uh, relevant and, and maintain industry's competitiveness can ensure the best results on the market. The methodology must take into account several environmental dimensions of a product and should assess the variables that consider the individual aspects across the whole life cycle of a product from material extraction until the end of life. Now, in terms of legislating hazardous substances, this is something I also really wanted to touch on. Um, there is already an appropriate and complete EU framework regulation put in place to effectively analyse and manage chemicals with REACH, ROS, FGAS, POPs. These existing rules should remain the primary set of legislation and have the leading role in risk assessing and managing chemicals in materials, articles and complex products. Chemicals are already well regulated basically by these uh, EU chemical legislations and setting requirements uh, related to substances of concern as defined in the ESPR could ultimately lead to double requirements on, product, on products that are already subject to other legislative frameworks. So this could generate um, an atmosphere uh, with a lack of legal clarity and certainty when it comes to compliance, not only to eco design rules, but also to other chemical legislation as well. Now, digital product passports, I've got a few slides um, on this. Um, we are in favour of a digital product passport, which relies on already existing databases such as 
skip and epril uh, in order to uh, avoid unnecessary and burdensome replication where all stakeholders contribute um, to delivering relevant information to um, the DPP. And information requirements of the DPP should be limited to to what is essentially relevant for those key stakeholders over the lifetime of the product. It's crucial to ensure that with information collected in the DPP, it'll be ultimately, it will ultimately add value and be available only on a need to know basis. And it's important that industry plays an active role in development of DPP, given its considerable knowledge about the information and value chains and existing systems and what is going to be relevant to each potential user. And some more points here, uh, the information in the DPP needs to be correct and trustworthy for the DPP to be a success. Again, I don't think that's controversial, but it's important as it ensures that competition is not distorted by companies that provide in incomplete or incorrect information. We need an effective enforcement of the content of DPP. Um, that's essential. We therefore recommend that criteria for the type of information that is included in the DPP must be legally and strictly defined by the European Commission in a centralised manner and applicable to all relevant supply chain actors. And data security and access to and access rights should be a priority. Again, a bit of a no brainer there. But we also see that there are further opportunities um, for the DPP as well. There should not only be coherency and consistency between energy labelling, performance labelling, DPP information requirements, but also compatibility with other information systems at international level to avoid any trade restrictions. Uh, and equally, a key opportunity for the DPP is to allow producers to provide relevant product information via digitally generated information labels instead of paper versions. This would also be an alternative to having to affix a label to packaging of a product, which is subject to complexities due to different languages and limited space on packaging for very small products. Such opportunities could be helped, um, could be used to help reduce waste. And my final slide now, as I know I'm going on for a while, so apologies. Uh, but just some additional thoughts um, on e ESPR. There needs to be a sufficient transition times given the impacts on um, production and innovation of products. There needs to be sufficient lead time between the publication uh, of legislation and application of new product requirements, um, particularly in the view of the need to, to develop harmonised standards. Uh, for legal requirements set by ESPR need to be effectively enforced as previously mentioned the methodology needs to leave no or minimal room for interpretation it should be black and white there is uh, needs to be availability of sufficient laboratory capacity and there are there are resources available to ensure enforcement activity of member states and finally just a little bit on flexibility of eco modulation if it's introduced just to account for changes we need to ensure any eco modulation is flexible enough so that it that it can adapt to changes in product design, innovation and, and reflect development of policy and standards. Sorry, that was very um, uh, quick that I had to run through that. And I think I still went over time, so apologies, uh, but that's everything from me. Thank you. I think that was definitely a good crash course in eco design for any of us who haven't followed it so much, but really uh, emphasising this harmonisation and consistency on the EU level. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Maria Banti. She is a policy officer from the Waste to Resources Unit in the European Commission's Environment Department, DG Envy. So to discuss the evaluation of the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive and other ongoing work in the European Commission, Ms. Banti, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And really thank you also for, um, uh, for the invitation. Um, I have some slides in the background. Uh, I think they will be probably, yes, ready to see. Uh, well, indeed, I would like to focus a bit more on, on the WE directive, in particular the, the legislation that is applicable for the waste streams or the, for the waste stream, uh, which is in our agenda of, uh, of that discussion today, the waste electrical and electronic equipment. Uh, indeed, we are currently uh, really running something like 20 years of experience now, In um, please, in the next slide, uh, since the very first uh, directive that was adopted in, uh, in 2002. 
2002, uh, the Commission has is evaluated and, and revised uh, the directive in, in 2012 uh, to set up uh, new uh, targets in particular for collection and recycling which are the main challenges uh, regarding this uh, waste stream but of course uh, looking at uh, the trends uh, it, it it is it's obvious that, uh, that that we is still in one of the fastest growing waste streams in Europe but also worldwide uh, no matter if the equipment is is lighter now what is placed on the market I mean it's it's always uh, we see that it's more and more uh, generated of course partly the growing consumption and the, the, the technological prog progress that the, the digitalization of the products will also pose future challenges uh, in uh, in uh, in the coming years so but if we really see the trend okay we see that we have achieved quite a lot from around 300 tons at the beginning of 2005 we reach about 4.5 million so we collected but still this is only the half of what we should we shall do of what is our target or on what we expect to achieve so actually in the next slide i'm just focusing a bit more on these great challenges on about collection and and recycling uh, we see currently that indeed uh, many member states are lacking behind to reaching their targets so indeed collection uh, as previous uh, speakers also pointed is it is the main uh, challenge of um, that we still need uh, uh, to face. Um, uh, the we recovering and preparing for use and recycling targets are set per specific categories of equipment. Most member states have reached these uh, targets. And uh, so uh, we consider that from the moment that we is collected, um, uh, proper treatment uh, could really take place in the EU. So. The starting point is indeed uh, the proper uh, collection, and that is one of the areas where we also uh, focus. Uh, we had um, from the side of the Commission what we call a compliance promotion initiative uh, uh, to assist uh, member states in um, providing good practices, in looking into the specific challenges and problems. And there we also provide some information which is which is always relevant on how to uh, what actions can member states take in order to further improve the situation? And of course, uh, it also built upon uh, on the member states' uh, treatment practices uh, uh, for we. Uh, these have also been uh, assessed uh, in light of possible further harmonization, uh, building actually on the practical experience uh, with the use of the European standards that have been developed already following uh, a mandate uh, by the Commission. Uh, but again, then pointing again one, once more on the collection and in particular on uh, the collection of um, uh, small consumer electronics, which are very uh, significant uh, also for the circular economy, but also in relation to critical raw materials and precious materials that are included in them. Uh, what is actually, um, that was indeed part of the um, uh, circular economy action plan, and uh, but actually now it's taking a bit more of, of a substance uh, through um, recommendations that we are preparing to improve uh, the take back of uh, used and waste small consumer electronics. So speaking about uh, increasing uh, also the take back uh, of um, used equipment in order to be reused, but also of waste equipment that is hoarded in uh, in households for years in order to be um, uh, prepared for use or recycled. Uh, this uh, this act, this recommendation is currently, you may know that uh, the Commission services are working on um, a critical raw materials act. And uh, this, uh, uh, for, for, for the moment, according to the planning so far, is going to be a uh, part of this um, uh, of the critical raw material, sorry, um, uh, package. It will be part of, of this initiative specific recommendations uh, to increase um, uh, the collection of uh, small consumer electronics. And there we also, we, we also speak about uh, uh, financial incentives uh, to be provided to uh, the users of the electronics in order to give it uh, to give such electronic packs to give it back uh, or um, uh, how 
member states can further uh, improve uh, awareness campaigns, uh, how they can further make it more visible to the users, uh, the collection points that they have um, available. Uh, so by, by creating and by developing electronic databases um, or by providing um, buyback scheme so that to provide to the users all this information that they need in order to know uh, what they can do with these uh, electronics at the end of life, but also uh, to give them some uh, incentives, economic incentives as well, in order to further incentivize them to bring these back uh, for reuse or for um, uh, for recycling. Uh, so this is one of the activities that is, is going on currently under the Critical um, Raw Materials Act, as I said. But the main element that I would like to, to, to raise and discuss with you today, uh, it's the evaluation of, um, of the WE directive. Uh, this is uh, a very first step, as we say, when we want to look into uh, the achievements of uh, of the directive uh, through over the last years, and we speak about the second we directive, so we want to see how things have changed from the adoption uh, the last ten years of of, uh, of the we uh, directive. So practically speaking, this is an evidence based assessment uh, where we want to see first of all how effective it has been the directive in fulfilling the expectation and and meeting each objective. We have already pointed before uh, challenges that are still existing. So practically speaking, uh, uh, the evaluation will pay particular attention, attention to aspects um, for which the implementation has been challenging. We mentioned collection. We mentioned also before that ensuring the proper treatment and the related level playing field is very crucial. Uh, it's also relevant also to, to mention here the, um, the EPR requirements and how this can be uh, applied uh, by all uh, producers, uh, in particular online sellers and online platforms is also uh, an important factor that we need to consider. And also in general, combating illegal practices, substandard processes in the whole a we management uh, a process and uh, of course apart from effective we also see the, the the efficient in terms of cost effectiveness and proportionality of the costs and benefits and uh, in particular how relevant uh, and it is um, uh, to current and emerging needs uh, and how coherent uh, not only by itself internally, but also to other EU interventions uh, uh, or international agreements. So practically speaking, we need to see, for example, um, the WE directive and how this have been involved and what has achieved or has not achieved also within the context of the objectives set out in the European Green Deal, in the Circular Economy Action Plan, and also take into consideration or all other relevant uh, developments um, uh, in EU environmental and waste policy, starting from, from uh, batteries, of course, uh, eco-design for, for sustainable products, uh, restriction of hazardous substances, uh, waste shipment regulation, um, and also international aspects like Basel Convention, but also, of course, um, the critical raw materials aspects uh, um, and also renewable energy policy. So it's it's a lot that it's it's linked to the WE directive. And of course, the directive will be evaluated within the context of, of all these objectives uh, set out. And uh, as an as the last criterion that we also want, uh, need to see is uh, how it is evaluated um, what is the EU added value? What would have been the result if, um, if there was no, uh, let's say, action from the EU? So the main things that we want to see from this evaluation is uh, to what extent, as I said, it has been successful, but mainly which are the problems and the challenges and in particular why these are the, these still exist or why this exists so it is there is a critical view as well and uh, of course uh, the, the lessons learned from all these um, um, years and then of course to decide what is uh, what can be from the side of the commission the next uh, steps as regards the review of the directive as such so i will just finish with just give you a couple of of dates or just pointing uh, a bit on the process uh, the what we call the call for evidence 
students. The first stakeholder consultation already took place uh, in October and November. And thank you also to the, the recyclers that uh, really uh, gave us some first ideas of where this uh, evaluation uh, should target. Uh, a support study is being launched already and it will finish end of January 24. Do in this context, there will be a, an open public consultation. It is expected in April and our uh, summary, our conclusion as what we call a commission staff working document is planned for uh, the second uh, uh, quarter of 24. So by, by June uh, 24, probably uh, we we would like to have uh, this um, conclusion regarding the evaluation and also I mean conclusions about our next steps on whether a review of the directive uh, would be needed and what would be then the aspects for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really interesting to hear how the evaluation is going so far. I think for anyone who's following any kind of recycling topics, we always hear that collection is an issue and, and here it seems to be the big issue again. Uh, our penultimate panellist is Tess Potsy. She is Institutional Affairs Officer for Dirichberg Environment and Chair of Eurex Waste Electronics and Equipment Working Group. So to give us your perspective on the legislation around waste electronics, Ms Potsy, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Um, indeed, I, I work for uh, Dirichberg Environment. I haven't got any slides, so I will... I will uh, give you a few insights of, of uh, my company. Um, it's um, a French um, family business, so we are mostly uh, um, implanted in France, but also in other other countries in the EU, and we are specialized in metal recycling, including uh, end-of-life vehicles and e-waste. Uh, and I'm really happy to represent today uh, the um, EURIC um, uh, organization and European recyclers. I will uh, mainly focus today on the evaluation of the, the WE directive and uh, the upcoming maybe revision of, of, this, uh, of this important uh, text for uh, e-waste recycling. And I will share uh, with you the priorities for uh, European recyclers on this issue. Uh, so it's really linked to Maria Banti's intervention. Uh, I will, I will um, um, address a few topics which uh, uh, Maria already uh, talked about and also Samsung on eco-design um, aspects. So um, to start um, recyclers, we strongly support uh, the European Commission's initiative to evaluate the, the, e, the WE directive because uh, we believe that there is really still place for uh, improvement to achieve the um, Green Deal's objectives. Uh, and a very important point for us is uh, regarding a structural reform, because uh, as uh, Samsung said regarding um, the um, eco design uh, regulation, uh, it's really important to go from a directive to a regulation, because as you know, um, directives really um, can lead to a lack of harmonization because directive leads to uh, transposition measures in the different member states. And so we believe that uh, transition from a WE directive to a regulation would allow a better consistent uh, application in all the member states. And for instance, in uh, France, there was a study um, that was uh, conducted a few years ago by uh, our environmental agency. And uh, it was really focusing on the transposition of the WE directive in the different member states. And this study put forward many differences. I will not <laughs> obviously go uh, over um, all of them, but just to, to, to share a few uh, examples, um, the differences between the member states were mainly regarding um, the creation of additional WE categories in some of the countries. Um, some countries, but only a few, have uh, mandatory recycled um, treatment standards, so really um, uh, go beyond uh, the, the re legislation today uh, regarding uh, technical aspects. We also have differences regarding uh, collection rates, which sometimes have been uh, uh, fixed per category of, of, um, of products. Um, and also on recycling rates, where some uh, countries have fixed uh, recycling rates which are higher than the, the ones of the European legislation. So 
Regarding a, a level playing field, um, we believe that uh, a revision maybe of the WE directive will lead to a better uh, level playing field in the, in the sector. And on top of those differences, um, some countries also have took extra miles in terms of requirements to comply with, uh, which often leads to an increased cost for the recyclers. And these extra costs are not always totally covered by the APR schemes when, when they are APR schemes. And this situation really can affect the innovation and research capacities for the recycling companies. So for recyclers, a regulation instead of a directive would really enable all actors in all the member states to abide uh, by the same rule. And if I stay on uh, structural reform, um, recyclers strongly support uh, the introduction of a link between the new uh, WE directive and uh, the um, ESPR, so the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, because there's this Article 5, which uh, lays um, the general framework for eco design requirements. And um, better product design is really essential for recycling in order to improve recycling, but also to reduce fires originating from batteries. I didn't, uh, I, I don't think I heard this topic yet. Um, for recyclers, the issue of uh, lithium batteries uh, and the fires originating from the, those uh, products containing lithium batteries is a really key issue. And what are the key problems uh, the recyclers are facing today uh, regarding eco design issue? Firstly, we need to limit uh, the gluing of components. I think we, um, as, um, it's not the first time you hear recyclers talk about uh, this, this issue because the gluing of components uh, really makes the dismantling operation difficult, if not impossible. So we need to increase the use of mechanical binding practices to, uh, to facilitate the recycling operations. And we also need to ensure that the batteries are more easily removable and not built in the equipments. So we know that uh, to change the, the way that the E products are produced will take time, but it's really important to start as by now with the ESPR and to really link the product policy to the recycling policy. And better eco design will improve the global recyclability of e waste and enable the recyclers to produce more recycled material. So, in that regard, uh, recyclers, we believe that setting up mandatory recycled content targets is also a very important point of the eco design policy, especially for plastics uh, in new electric and electronic appliances. And to finish with mandatory recycled uh, content targets, they will also ensure the achievement of the collection targets. Uh, I heard with the, the previous uh, speakers that uh, indeed we do not yet achieve and we are far from achieving the recycling targets. So there's also tools to, to push for the um, recycling targets and higher collection rates uh, could, be, uh, could be a solution. So I shared the, um, the views from a recycler's uh, perspective regarding uh, the change from a directive to a regulation and also the urgent need for better product design. And regarding higher collection rates, um, it will uh, undeniably help to uh, help the sa to satisfy the increase in demand in raw materials from recycling. Um, the decarbonization issues will um, push manufacturers to uh, to consume more recycled materials and less virgin uh, materials. So we also believe that to improve the collection rates, um, we should uh, have. Uh, obligations to meet the collection rates at regional level and not only at a nat national level. Uh, that would uh, this would help to focus in different uh, territories and not only to have a global um, objective to to reach at uh, at the member states level. 
And also for well-functioning circular economy, we believe that when the collection rates are achieved, efforts for further collection should continue and not stop there. This is also a very important point. And Maria Banti talked about the Critical Raw Materials Act. And from our perspective, to increase the collection rates is really totally linked to this uh, priority file for the European Commission, because if we increase the recollection rate, then we also will increase the collection of critical raw materials. And to finish on uh, the recyclers' priorities, we strongly support uh, laying down mandatory minimum quality treatment standards based on uh, all the work done by the Senelec on uh, treatment standards for we because it really helps to measure the depollution and the recycling recovery performance of the plants and it's really not um, applied in all the countries only in a few countries and it's really the only um, uh, way to have um, a level playing field to to be able to have uh, quality treatment standards but the condition for us is that uh, the cost linked to the implementing of binding uh, minimum standards, including uh, the cost of audits, uh, shall be continuously covered by EPR schemes because it's it's really an important point to be aligned um, through the member states on, on this issue. So it's just the beginning of uh, the work on the new WE directive, if, if there is one. So we will be glad to continue to work uh, with the uh, the different players on this uh, important uh, topic for us. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. So again, a big focus on harmonisation. Uh, finally, we have Mathieu Rama. Um, he is Programme Manager at ECOS, the Environmental Coalition on Standards, where he works on eco-design regulation and focuses on product policy, in particular on circular electronics. So to talk more about eco-design, Mr Rama, you have the floor. I think you're on mute. Classic. Sorry about that. Um, no, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kira, for uh, for the uh, introduction, and, uh, and thanks to Ricanto and Yurik uh, for uh, the invitation to this webinar. So, um, as we are uh, approaching the end of January, I think uh, this is the last opportunity to reflect on 2022, as it might feel awkward to to do it later. So, th this was a terrible year on so many aspects, but not for everything, fortunately. Uh, indeed, it might have been the most uh, fruitful year so far in terms of fight against uh, e-waste, uh, mostly because EU policies indicate a serious shift towards tackling this problem at its source rather than at its destination. So I don't want to diminish all the efforts that have been made, which are essential in terms of uh, policies for the collection and treatment of e-waste in the EU. Uh, but many people here today will agree with me when I say that the best waste is one that doesn't exist. And uh, I believe this is what EU eco-design policies are now starting to promote for electronic products. Um, so first, I will take a moment to introduce the organization that represents uh, ECOS. So we are uh, an international NGO with a network of uh, members and experts advocating for environmentally friendly technical standards and legislation. Uh, the main reason of our existence was the need to represent the voice of environmental NGOs in the uh, industry-dominated world of uh, standardization. And uh, for this, we benefit from a pool of technical experts uh, basing their inputs on uh, solid scientific data. And uh, given the interlinking of product policies and standards, we are also heavily involved uh, in influencing EU product policies, including, of course, eco-design policies. So, um, a very short, uh, actually not really historical, but just a, a reminder of what eco design policies were made for at the beginning. So uh, initially, it was designed to tackle the energy efficiency of energy related products, including electronic products, of course. And now uh, more and more repairability and reliability requirements are developed for, um, for these products. So they have been finalized for white goods such as fridges, dishwashers and washing machines a bit more than three years ago, I believe, and are now implemented at EU level. Um, for example, they allow professional repairers and consumers to have access to certain spare parts 
and have them delivered within five working days. And this is on top of having access to certain repair information. Uh, it also ensures that these spare parts are made uh, replaceable so that you don't have to destroy the product when replacing them. Um, so not only removable, but replaceable. Uh, it is a little bit difficult to estimate at this stage um, what is the impact of these policies on the longevity of these products because uh, it's still quite recent. Uh, but we hopefully anticipate that more fun uh, repair will be favored uh, over replacement. Uh, these resource efficiency requirements also include recyclability features, uh, such as making it mandatory for manufacturers uh, to provide smelting information on a free access website. Um, at the moment, uh, there are other product categories, such as mobile phones, tablets, computers, and printers, uh, which are under the microscope of the Commission. Uh, for mobile phones and tablets, the final versions of the eco design and energy labeling requirements should be validated by maximum four months. Um, it will launch actually the first uh, repair index at EU level, uh, inspired uh, by the French experiments. It's, this repair label uh, will be added to the energy label, which will actually contain more information about uh, reliability and repairability than about energy efficiency. You can see this, uh, the draft label, uh, so not the final, very final version, even though we don't think that there has been any changes made to this draft. Uh, so the um, label for smartphone is on the bottom right of uh, this slide. Um, so um, we, we think actually it could, it could be the time to call it the sustainability lab label instead of the energy label, because now it won't include uh, information only on, uh, on energy efficiency. Um, and unfortunately, um, all these efforts to make products more repairable, reliable, reusable, and like to summarize, uh, more durable, uh, are also tarnished by uh, regrettable omissions. Uh, for example, consumers won't have access to the same list of spare parts as professional repairers. Uh, they won't have access to the same level of repair information uh, either. And also the price of spare parts is not yet acceptably uh, tackled as manufacturers and sellers of mobile phones and tablets uh, will only be forced to inform consumers about uh, an expected price uh, that can and that will uh, be subject to changes. Um, so consumers will only have access to partial information about the price of spare parts. Um, and as the price of repair operations is often the main factor that end users consider. It is essential to find a current coherent way at EU level to tackle this issue. Because it is currently uh, possible to find a spare part that costs nearly the price of the whole product itself, uh, making their repair an economic nonsense. Uh, it's especially true, for example, for motherboards um, that now are in uh, most electronic products, including white goods. Um, then, uh, of course, uh, I need to touch upon also the update of the Econizac Directive. It's been uh, talked about a lot already, uh, already today, but still um, it's important to focus on that. Um, so, um, so, yeah, this will turn uh, the Econizac Directive into a regulation and also make it possible to add other categories of products to the list of those that are already tackled by Econizac minimum requirements. So you might have heard already of the inclusion of non-energy uh, non related products. So you might very probably end up with eco-design requirements on textiles too. Um, and another objective of this update is the possibility to tackle several product groups at once when it is estimated that similar eco-design requirements could apply to similar categories of products. So this aspect uh, for us is essential uh, to speed up the impact of eco-design policies because tackling the durability of electronic equipment product by product. It is essential, but it will also take a lot of time and it doesn't really translate the urgency that we need in terms of Im improving the, uh, the sustainability of its products. So a horizontal approach is uh, very much welcome. Um, the Commission has only pitched the possibility to do that in its proposal. But other policymakers, such as uh, the main European Parliament supporter, MEP Alessandra Moretti, I think supported also by, um, by um, Sarah Mathieu, has already proposed uh, ICT products and other electronics as a priority product groups uh, to be tackled by the Commission in its uh, next eco design working plan. Um, so, next eco design working plan, which is due to, to start in 2024 and supposed to last until 2027. 
Uh, and another proposal made uh, in, uh, in the draft uh, report by the European Parliament to remove the possibility for the industry to regulate itself uh, through voluntary agreements on uh, eco-design requirements. Uh, and it's very important because experience has shown that voluntary agreements are always hollow and with no ambition to go beyond the status quo. Uh, so it's very important to have um, eco-design requirements developed through, uh, through the normal, let's say, uh, um, the legislative process and not through um, voluntary agreements which, which uh, leave a lot of uh, power to uh, the industry. So um, to conclude this speech, uh, I, will, I also wanted to touch upon two other initiatives that are relevant to electronic police uh, secularity. Uh, so first of all, the update of the radio equipment directive, which will make the USB-C connector the mandatory standard for a series of electronic products, including some that are not even tackled yet by ecodesign policy. Uh, so this is very interesting. And this will help the EU save on a significant amount of resources. We are making redundant the purchase of several different cables to recharge our uh, everyday electronics. And it can look like a drop in the ocean, but it's actually the first time that a spare part standard is made mandatory across uh, several types of products at once. Uh, and actually both the US and Indian governments are considering doing the same. So uh, this EU policy has a ripple effect. And so we can consider that its impact goes well beyond uh, the EU. And uh, this can also be a blueprint for other types of spare parts, uh, such as batteries. Um, because the standardization of spare parts can be important to uh, to drive competition between ma manufacturers of, of these spare parts and decrease the cost of uh, these parts. So when we want to make repair more affordable, uh, this is something which should be taken into account. Uh, and this leads me actually to the last policy initiative I wanted to comment on before leaving uh, the mic open for questions. Uh, it is the update of the battery regulation that will contain uh, an article about the replaceability of batteries by end users. Uh, actually, this article is also a perfect example of a horizontal approach to secularity, as this will make all the products containing batteries follow the principle of battery replaceability. Uh, there will unfortunately be a few exceptions, such as uh, appliances that are designed uh, to be used underwater or next to splashing water sources. Um, as well as medical equipment, uh, for which it's more understandable. Um, and the battery will still have uh, to be uh, replaceable, um, even in the, the context of these exceptions, but only by professional repairers. So basically, uh, all the battery containing products um, will have to be replaceable by end users, except for uh, these um, waterproof ones and uh, the medical equipment, which would have to be uh, replaceable by professional repairers. Um, and so actually, this was the opportunity for uh, policymakers to create a definition of uh, independent professional repairers, uh, which will probably be used again in other initiatives promoting repair. Uh, another big step forward towards the clarity of batteries and electronic products in general is uh, the agreement on min minimum recycle content for cobalt, lead, lithium, and nickel. Uh, this will set a precedent, as this is, at least to my knowledge, I might be wrong, but I think uh, I'm right. Uh, it would be the first time that minimum recycle content is met mandatory at EU level for a given product. Um, and uh, however, this will only concern certain types of uh, industrial batteries with a capacity above two kilowatts per hour, so not all batteries. Um, and um, through delegated acts, the Commission will also uh, set minimum performance and durability requirements uh, for portable batteries of general use. So this will tackle single-use batteries that haven't been banned by the latest agreement, unfortunately. Um, to conclude, I'll say that the overall direction that the Commission has taken in terms of improving the secularity of your products is very encouraging. Uh, the main concern that we have is actually the delays. Uh, the co-design plans are usually, are usually delayed by one or two years, uh, mostly because of a lack of means given to the services responsible for the drafting of these initiatives, uh, which is a shame uh, considering the importance of these policies. Um, and also we believe that all these eco-design requirements on products are only the first step towards uh, the achievement of a truly secular economy, because making products more sustainable, uh, more durable, will not necessarily result in an overall decrease of uh, resource use. 
um, because longer living products can still end up being used the same way as short lived products if discarded too early because of a different uh, premature obsolescence strategies, like for example, aggressive commercial strategies that will encourage you to replace your product even though it's still working perfectly. Uh, so we, we therefore look forward uh, to reading the Commission's proposal on the uh, sustainable consumption of goods uh, that will look at encouraging consumers to favor repair over replacement. Uh, this is supposed to be published uh, the 22nd of March. Um, and uh, eventually, we, the Commission will also have to consider uh, setting resources use targets, uh, which we are very happy also has been suggested by, um, by certain MPs. Um, or uh, the ESPR. So I'll stop there and uh, leave the mic for uh, the questions. Thank you. Well, we can now go on to our Q&A session. I can see some questions in the chat, but please uh, keep sending them in. If I could ask all the panelists to turn on their cameras, uh, just so we can get a good conversation going. Um, I think the the area I'd like to start here, you know, we, we had some questions, which I think would be good for Samson to ask, uh, answer. Um, so we have a question from Rob Franken. Um, asking how much um, how much uh, electronic and electronic equipment does Samson put on the market annually? I guess maybe compared to how much is then collected. And then I guess the other question that came from Ms. Potsy's um, intervention, we heard about you know, uh, battery fires. Is this an issue you're aware of? And if so, what are you doing to tackle this issue? Yeah, that's no problem. Um, in terms of the amount of electronics we place on the market, I'm afraid I don't have that information to hand, I'm afraid. We're obviously a large uh, producer of electronics, but I'm afraid I do not have that information to me to answer that question. Um, in regards to battery fires, things like that, of course, this is something um, we are aware of. Um, and that's um, and in terms of what um, we we believe the solution there. I think it's a term in um, ensuring that batteries and electronics are recycled and disposed of correctly. I think there is still a lot of, um, I don't think ignorance is the right word necessarily, but I still don't think um, a, a, lot, a lot of consumers are aware of how and where they should be um, uh, you know, properly disposing of of batteries and electronic waste, and when they do get mixed, um, yeah, it, it absolutely can um, uh, co cause uh, 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 the ha the hazardous nature of batteries to 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 cause uh, yeah for fires, which obviously we are aware of. So I think there it comes down to uh, consumer engagement more than anything else, and making sure consumers are um, aware of how they should be disposing of that. And we obviously do take um, offer take back of um, old equipment, which will allow us to properly, um, uh, you know, uh, take uh, the products away to be disposed of and 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 reprocessed correctly, and will also allow for more reuse as well. Thank you. Ms. Fox, maybe let's come to you next as you mentioned that issue. We also have a question from uh, Thomas Francis um, who said, I would be interested in the views of the French participants. Has the introduction of the French Repairability Index had an effect on consumer behaviour when they are selecting products? Uh, yes, Kira. Thank you for the for the question. Uh, um, regarding this index, um, to be honest, we we don't have a, a, a clear view on the effects. Uh, we have uh, really uh, many discussions at the French level with the representatives of the um, uh, uh, producers and with the APR schemes. On this index, I can't answer, but um, I believe it's it's not sufficient because in France, uh, since really the end of uh, 2022, uh, there's been a, the launch of a fund, a reparation fund, uh, to um, really push the consumers to um, repair their electric and electronic equipment and the producers 
uh, through the APR scheme have, has to ab abound uh, in a, a fund to um, help. I think it's like from 10 to 45 euros per reparation to to really push for uh, reparation activities. So it's really recent. It's been la launched in December. So I, I believe this will have um, maybe um, um, uh, an, in, an effect that we could uh, see because uh, we will uh, monitor the demands for the this um, uh, bonus rep reparation bonus we call it. Uh, but sorry, on the repairability index, I, I can't tell you if it's uh, it's working already. It's it's a, a new disposal dispositive. I can maybe intervene on that point, like in the front of me, a report from uh, HOP, so Alta L'Obsessance Programme, which is a French NGO um, very active in um, fighting against the programmed obsolescence uh, and on premature obsolescence, um, rather. And um, from their study, so they studied uh, 1,200 uh, people um, who say that so 55% uh, knew about uh, the repair index. So it was a study which was uh, made quite recently, about not too long after uh, the uh, implementation of the law. So uh, maybe some, many uh, users didn't have to buy a product which uh, which had the uh, repair index. So 55% of the French uh, citizens um, being aware of the existence of this, of, uh, this repair index is already something. And um, three uh, quarters of them, also of those who were aware of this uh, index, uh, used it as a, in their decision to purchase a product or not. So it did influence uh, consumers into uh, buying products uh, which are more repairable. That's uh, let's say the uh, the result we can uh, we can get from uh, from this study. Thank you. And now a question to Ms. Banti and Ms. Mature. Well, two questions, but maybe let's start uh, with you, Ms. Banti. So two questions from Andrea uh, Krasowski. Um, how far is the topic of illegal imports, i.e. Uh, concrete monitoring obligations for online marketplaces for due diligence, for example, for manufacturers as in Germany with great success, uh, EU expansion would be very effective for this. Uh, so how much of that is addressed in the WE, I assume, directive, but also evaluation by the Commission? Um, and also, how are horizontal eco-design requirements in the WE set in parallel to the ESPR? Ms. Banti, let's start with you on that. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, well, indeed, uh, the, the current WE directive as it is, uh, it defines the producer as any producer placing equipment on the market. So online producer is by definition responsible. But of course, we speak what we call the free rider. So that producers selling online from anywhere in the world that cannot, we cannot really identify or we cannot somehow track or oblige them really to fulfill their, their financial and uh, EPR obligations in general. This, this, is, this is the general uh, issue that we have. It's not only for we. Imagine, for example, we is placed on the market with a, in a box, so it is relevant for packaging and may include a battery. So it's it's relevant for uh, many of the products under EPR rules, and therefore we also try to this uh, to see this more horizontally. For sure, under the evaluation, we will see examples like Germany. We we know in and France in their legislations that they are putting specific rules really to oblige or to to reach the marketplaces and make them fulfill their obligations that will be for sure part of of the evaluation and for sure it's something that we could we will concretely see for uh, next steps possibly uh, but it is it is not only an issue for we it's quite uh, quite more general and on the second question oh. about those um horizontal mm -hmm. um design mm -hmm. requirements between we and espr Yes, indeed. Well, uh, again, the WE directive as such makes reference to uh, the Eco Design uh, Directive. And uh, we know that so far, uh, so it is a general reference in the directive itself, there are no specific requirements on the design of products because exactly so far the design of the products has been part of the Eco Design Directive. Uh, currently, there are different uh, product groups for which Eco Design Directives 
are ex exist or are into a place or will be into a place in the couple of, of months, as uh, a, uh, Matthew also mentioned. So it is um, it is still uh, again an issue that we will also check uh, during uh, during the evaluation how this uh, how this can be addressed and also uh, openly speaking we we hear more and more from from stakeholders that the we directives shall also see the whole chain from the design of the product to the management uh, so to take such an approach but to take such an approach would mean that we also need to somehow include or to see how we uh, we put together also existing requirements or requirements that are uh, that are to be planned. So for sure, under the the SPR, we are we are in contact, and uh, during this evaluation, uh, it will be one of the issues that we will need to see uh, how things can be can be addressed uh, in the, in the future, in particular on eco design. Ms. Michelle, let's come to you next on this. So what's the European uh, Parliament's perspective on this, on, on illegal imports, particularly from the you know, online marketplaces and the compliance there, uh, and then this interaction between we and ESPR? Well, I think it's, um, it's a very, very uh, valid question, uh, because of course, when we're talking about the single market uh, and uh, when we're talking about um, the level playing field, uh, if you put um, our European companies that do need to comply uh, with all of these regulations in concurrence um, with companies that, that don't or, you know, that don't uh, actually follow the rules, of course, then you're going to get into trouble. And I know it's something, and I mean, the Commission has, has answered uh, to that effect as well, um, that is important uh, to check. And I think indeed it's interesting to look at um, best practices where certain member states are already a lot stricter, um, because of course it's something uh, we need to regulate on the European level, but we also need member states to really check via customs controls, uh, via different websites, uh, etc., to make sure that the products that come on our market are actually compliant uh, with the laws that we uh, that we put forward and uh, the norms uh, that we implement when it comes to our, our products. So I think it's a very important uh, point uh, to be made. Um, when it comes to sort of the relationship uh, between we uh, and uh, and the ESPR, I mean, of course, we're still in the middle of um, of developing um, the ESPR and 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 what the the leading principles uh, should be. But there are certain things already we know uh, present uh, within uh, within the we. For instance, and I've, I've mentioned it, um, well, we have recycling targets for certain product categories, but not really for materials, you know, and it's one of those things where I think uh, in the ESPR we need to uh, we need to tackle that uh, because otherwise, like I said, uh, you might um, get a lot of recycling for aluminium, but perhaps not for some other of the other more valuable uh, materials that are used in uh, in those products um, but of course I mean at the same time you also need to take into account the SPR is uh, for all products so it's very broad uh, it's a horizontal legislation uh, we still um, after that or the commission still has to come up with delegated acts uh, that are more specific and I think well there the interplay between what the Commission is doing uh, on revising or evaluating uh, the we vis-a-vis um, -vis what needs to be done uh, via a delegated act uh, on electronics and uh, and electrical appliances and I mean I've said it and and our uh, our rapporteur also wants this to be a priority uh, within the working plan of the Commission and I mean that's for uh, for the reason of course that there's so much impact there. So I think it's a bit early still to see really what the interplay uh, is going to be, but there are already some of those horizontal requirements where we have our eye uh, on, where we think via the ASPR, uh, it can really be fortified. And overall, do you think that, uh, you know, everything we're seeing with ESPR and also the re-evaluation, whatever comes of that, do you think that is enough to reach the targets of the Circular Economy Action Plan, or do you see that more is needed? 
Well, I think more is needed specifically because, of course, we've been talking about eco design, we've been talking about collection, uh, recycled content, uh, all of those things. Um, but one of the, the big critiques uh, that I still have uh, when it comes to the plans of the Commission is that there is no real sense of, of, of goal or indicator like, OK, um, how, how much less materials are we going to use? Uh, what kind of uh, environmental footprint is still um, is still acceptable uh, to us? So there, uh, I really think we need to step up the game, and that's something that I want to strengthen uh, within the framework of uh, of ESPR, for instance. I also think we need to to look further and really. Well, we need to have a system change uh, in the sense that, of course, it's not just a question of having the same amount of products, but just better designs. Uh, we also need to buy less. Um, I mean, look, for instance, at the whole modal shift uh, that needs to happen if you are going to replace every combustion vehicle with an electrical one. Well, then when it comes to resources and, and materials, we are not uh, going in the right direction. And I think that there, there's also still um, some convincing to do uh, to really build in that system change as well and make sure that we actually end up uh, using less material um, and having a different way of, uh, of looking at our economy and our production. Thank you. Tess Potsy, I'd like to come to you next with a similar question. You know, we've heard all of this legislation that's um, being discussed at the moment. Is this enough to reach the Circular Economy Action Plan targets or do you feel like there is more needed, particularly from the recycling industry's perspective? Thank you, Kira. Um, I think we the main issues we discussed uh, during this webinar are the eco design regulation and the WE directive. And Really, the point uh, which links both for recyclers is um, the recycled content. To have mandatory recycled content for plastics, uh, especially, is really um, the, the 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 way we can boost the circular economy. And it's also, and I I told it uh, previously, but it's also the way we could achieve higher collection rates. So. I think really the ESPR should really focus also on this issue and have a, a real link to the, the future improvements of the, the WE regulation. I just wanted to comment uh, the um, digital passport product because um, Samsung, the representative of Samsung um, uh, addressed this topic and I just wanted to, to give you the, the recycles um, perspective on this uh, DPP. I'm not really familiar with the, this acronym, but um, it's a, a good tool for, um, for consumers because it will bring um, many information. So like the index repairability, it's, it's like tr more transparency on products. So it will uh, undeniably help consumers to choose and to better consume. For recycling at activities, it can also be a, um, a good step forward. Um, but mostly I think the repairing industry will uh, benefit also from uh, this uh, digital passport product because the repairing industry, they more than the recycling industry, they have an individual product approach because Recyclers, we recycle waste in bulk. So um, I think the digital prospect product will be um, uh, a good a good thing for um, new product put on the markets because for specific products, it will help recyclers to better know um, what, uh, what components or substances they contain. And also for um, uh, really big products, which uh, arrive di directly at recycle, um, recycling activity plants. Um, but it's not sufficient at, as itself. Uh, the digital passport product for the recyclers uh, is, uh, is not uh, the only tool, and it really must be linked to um, the eco design policy uh, to uh, improve uh, the conception of the products. More information, it's it's always a good thing, but it's not sufficient. It's really a combination of tools that uh, will be uh, useful for um, improving recyclability and recycling activities. I hope I answered your question. 
Thank you. And on DPP, I think if you are in Brussels long enough, everything ends up with an acronym. Um, Mr. Sora, I'd like to come to you next um, on that. So, I mean, we've just had mandatory recycled content uh, mentioned and a digital product passport as well. How does that actually work in practice for a manufacturer like Samsung? So, so I think there are a, a couple of parts to this. Uh, the, the first point I probably want to make is, is uh, uh, you know, Samsung and Entry are, are, you know, are supportive of uh, increased uh, recycled content and uh, um, within within products. I think the key thing for us is availability and quality of that material. Um, currently, it, there is simply put not enough um, uh, high quality uh, um, uh, recycled material in order for for everyone within the industry to properly utilize and incorporate that into their products so there needs to be development there um because uh, without without that uh, the, the cost of such material would be uh, astronomical in the ceiling would simply wouldn't be an, an, enough to do uh, to to utilize it properly anyway um the, the second aspect of that is um again there needs to be again this goes back to my slide slightly is is that there needs to be proper um lead time for industry in order to to adapt to these kind of things um where especially when it comes to product design and uh you know in terms of safety and uh, making making and making sure the product is is adequate for market um sometimes in terms of proper research and development in order to incorporate ESA in entirely recycled material or new materials or anything like that you know it can take it's you know sometimes you know 10 plus years in order to make sure it is uh, still up to standard whether that be with durability uh, recyclability still or, or just straight um, straight up with safety so th that is probably one of the real big issues with with us in terms of legislation is giving industry enough time to to make sure we can implement any targets that are introduced and engaging with industry to make sure those those lead-in times are um, are adequate, basically. Maria Banti, I'd like to come to you next, partly to respond to that, but also we have a question which I think kind of links to at least a uh, recycled content, or at least kind of getting that content back into the system where it can be used. So from Julia Wolf, um, you, uh, Ms. Banti, you mentioned that buyback schemes are discussed under the Critical Raw Materials Act. Is there just a discussion about EU member states initiating or promoting these schemes, or is there a discussion to make it mandatory for me, um, manufacturers or distributors to buy back electric equipment? Could you respond to those ones, please? Yes, yes. Thank you for the for the question. Maybe yeah, it's a good occasion to to clarify a bit on on the recommendations. What we actually now try it's really it's it's really a very preliminary step it, to give uh, some member states some some tools, some uh, uh, ideas on how they can improve take back of such equipment. And actually, what we propose there is. Um, we propose them to use specific tools in order uh, and uh, and means in order to allow for the user first of all to call to calculate the value of the equipment that they have so at that moment it's already an incentive for them to know that my mobile phone my tablet my computer if i have a specific tool to see what is the value on the basis of the state of, of, of the status of it's functional it's not functional it, it has some defaults or whatever to to give them an indication of the value and of course then the second step is that okay somebody needs to 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 pay back to give this to give this value so in practice we have seen that there are uh, we have we have touched on started from experience from member states where they implement such uh, such measures that uh, they can uh, there, there are such take back schemes already and they can function quite well for the moment we really focus on establishing really these um, uh, these means these tools in order to allow the user to know what could be a value of the product and that is uh, that has been implemented not only by member states but also by specific um, um 
uh, providers, telecom providers, or also producers. I don't know if it is Samsung one of them, uh, but uh, uh, some others, some have done. I, I don't remember if it is also as well. But yeah, for the moment, this is what we 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 plan, and it is a recommendation for the moment. We don't speak about mandatory schemes. It's it's a recommendation among others on tools that could be could be used. And of course, we we want to see how these recommendations can be tested. And also, we have actually called uh, for um a, we we had a call for life projects projects that the commission will uh, will support financially and uh, one call was specifically to test this kind of recommendations we still wait for the results we don't know if there's going to be at the end such a project but if if that would be uh, one then it would be really a, a very good occasion to also test in practice in reality uh, specific recommendations and that could also fit us for the next steps uh, for for a possible review to see in the future if specific elements could be put in a kind of mandatory uh, basis. But for the moment, uh, uh, we are not there. So, Mathieu, I'd like to come to you next on this. We've heard a lot today about kind of cost effectiveness, whether it comes to, you know, making sure that there is a market for secondary raw materials or just the cost or availability of these. What as a policymaker can you do to ensure that there is this availability for something like recycled content? This one was, was for me, right, Kira? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, I mean, it's it's a bit of a chicken or the egg um, discussion, of course, uh, where, well, you can say you need a certain percentage of, uh, of recycled content built in uh, to your design. And I think it would be a good idea because that would make a better uh, economical uh, market value uh, for secondary raw materials, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the virgin ones. But of course, it needs to be coupled um, with take-back schemes, with uh, collection systems, um, with basically an entire industrial framework uh, for the circular economy to make sure that you actually have access uh, to uh, these, uh, these secondary uh, materials. So I think it's not something you can change overnight. Uh, and in that sense, I do understand uh, what uh, Benedict is saying uh, coming from, uh, from the industry. It's one thing, you know, you put it in, in, in your design requirements, but of course you need to have access uh, to uh, those, uh, those materials. But I think it's, it's, you, need, you need to have both. And you need to have projections, of course, in um, the, rapid, the rapidity uh, of the percentage of uh, that recycled content. And we already have uh, some numbers there, I think, and the Commission has also looked into it. We know that there uh, are certain product categories where we are going faster, uh, like the batteries, uh, the battery regulation, where indeed a percentage of uh, recycled content is part of it and it does increase over time. I mean, it's logical, right? If you look, for instance, at the market of, I don't know, uh, car batteries, uh, we know uh, in the next couple of years, uh, there will be a huge boom uh, in the use of, of these uh, batteries. And then, you know, of course, after a certain period, uh, these will get recycled and then you will have your, uh, your recycled content, right? So, I mean, it's a question of, of doing both and it's a question of um, making sure you do it at the right pace. Um, but I think it's crucial uh, if you really want to boost uh, recyclability and to make sure that it's actually economically viable, uh, that, that you do it in, in that way, um, in an attainable way, uh, but also in an, uh, in an ambitious way. And that's really what we want to build in uh, as a system uh, within the SPR. Thank you. Mr. Rama, I'd like to come to you next on this, both on mandatory recycled content and maybe to respond to anything else we've heard on the panel today. Oh, I'm unfortunately not such an expert on recycled content. Um, but uh, yeah, I can only support the, uh, the idea because uh, obviously like, if, if we want to encourage a collection of, um, of products or by recycling, uh, there needs to be a motivation. And as currently this motivation doesn't seem to be pushed by economic uh, criteria, it needs to be pushed by policy uh, requirements. So 
I mean, I will start there because I'm not such an expert on recycled content. I'm more about uh, repairability and uh, uh, prolonging lifetime. Uh, so I don't have such an expertise on that, but uh, but yeah, I can only support, of course, uh, this uh, this idea. Of course, and maybe uh, Ms. Potsy, yeah. we uh, you started this conversation about mandatory recycled content, so maybe you can finish it. Um, you know, we we heard some differing opinions there. What's your view on those? I heard uh, indeed the um, the worries of uh, the producer producer representative through Samsung on availability, if I understand well, and uh, the quality issues uh, regarding availability. Um, we recycle more and more plastics. Uh, uh, the through the year, we uh, the recycling industry um, invests a lot in new. Um, uh, cap recycling facilities, sorting facilities. So um, the question of mandatory recycled content is also to boost the demand, but the this, the availability of the plastics is also linked to the collection rates. So if we improve the collection rates, then we will have sufficient um, plastics, uh, recycled plastics for the producers. And regarding the the, the quality, um, I think it's uh, it's not a question of bad quality, low quality. It's a question on of standards. And we um, on the different materials we work with producers uh, on standards, material standards, and. We are capable of adapting our um, sorting processes, our recycling processes, to uh, answer the, the requirements of uh, different uh, grades. So I think it's it's not really a yeah, global issue. It's really a case to case um, issue, and I, I'm not sure it's going to to block uh, the development of the. Uh, recycling plastic consumption but i understand the point and I, I it's not the first time i hear them so we 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 uh, invest uh, a lot of um uh, of uh, our uh, i don't uh, can't find the, the english term but uh, the recycling industry is really a, a huge actor of uh, innovation and the the um, our key uh, preoccupation is the quality so Thank you. It mustn't and be a problem. Thank you. I think we've come to almost the end of our panel, but I would quickly like to ask all of our panelists to give a closing statement, maybe 30 seconds so that we stay on time, um, to finish us off. Mature Rama, let's come to you first. What's your key takeaway from our discussion today? Well, um, I think that yeah, improving the longevity of, of products as a first step to uh, improving the circularity of electronic products uh, with uh, second step, another objective to have dark targets on uh, on uh, resource use, as suggested by Sarah Mathieu, because I, I can't see any other uh, indicator uh, about which actually looks at uh, the impact of our consumption on uh, on the environment. Thank you. Uh, then next door, and let's, let's come to you next. What's your takeaway from today's discussion? Yeah, no problem. Um, I, I I think the the main uh, uh, takeaway for me is, is it probably a dialogue through all actors in the supply chain. I think industry very much wants to work with um, specifically recyclers in order to um, close the loop and increase their own circularity. And um, sometimes it's just uh, how we go about doing that and, and uh, actually accessing that material in order to do so. Same with dialogue with um, uh, th those who are uh, forming um, legislation as well. Industry wants to be involved, we want to be at the table and we want to, to help. It's just about accessibility from us and, 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 and uh, mutual cooperation. And Tess Potsy, we heard recyclers mentioned there. What's your response? Sorry, I didn't understand the, the last uh, part of your question. What's your takeaway from today's discussion? Um, I believe um, many uh, improvements to come, more uh, changes, but harmonization for all the the uh, shareholders because it's um, we are in the EU, so we have to uh, abide by the same rules and we have to work hand in hand. That's uh, an important issue to to move forward. Sarah Mature, what's your takeaway? 
Well, it's great to uh, to have all these different perspectives uh, around the table. Uh, as a lawmaker, that's of course a very uh, very interesting thing to see. And I really uh, believe um, that not only SPR, but the whole package uh, on the Circular Economy Action Plan could really be a game changer uh, for our industries in, in Europe. And I mean, for me, this was only confirmed uh, by the discussion that we had today. Uh, of course, uh, we still uh, have some steps to take uh, in the development of, of all of that on design, but also on um, the, further, the further development, of course, of our recycling uh, facilities. But I'm super optimistic. Uh, I really think uh, more and more um, companies, but also lawmakers see the potential, um, see the potential not only for our economy, but also for bettering our living environments and, and reducing our, uh, our ecological footprint, not to mention the whole discussion, of course, on, uh, on strategic autonomy. Uh, that has kicked out uh, now that um, the IRA uh, is there. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic and, and even more um, motivated uh, to work further on, on these uh, parts of legislation. Thank you. And our final panelist, Maria Bantu, what's your takeaway from the discussion? Thank you. It has been really very, very interesting and very fruitful, I think, for, for us having the initiative of uh, preparing legislation or evaluating and putting things, uh, seeing the needs. Uh, it's really important to, to hear from, from the industry, all different actors uh, uh, that uh, taking part in, uh, in this um, discussion, but also affected by the different uh, policies. It is a lot on the table. We understand that it is from different aspects coming a lot. Our intention is try to be coherent and put them uh, uh, all in in the in, in an order that could uh, could also help uh, of course uh, improve the environmental conditions uh, uh, but also to boost uh, to boost the, the industry so what i take it's really the the engagement of, of actors to be involved in the next uh, processes uh, and uh, and support uh, with the development of the new initiatives thank you very much Thank you. Well, thank you to all our panellists and thank you to everyone who submitted their questions. Uh, to close our discussion today, we have Emmanuel Kachkris, the Secretary General of UREC. So thank you to everyone for joining and I will leave you in his capable hands to round up this discussion. Mr Kachkris, you have the floor. Thank you, Kira, and, and thank you to, to all the panellists for basically having an extremely refreshing and dynamic uh, debate. Um, I think if I try to sum up uh, the, the main topics that were discussed, um, and starting obviously with the first uh, speaker, Sir so Giuseppe Piardi, uh, I wanted to stress, and despite the fact that unfortunately um, that was not uh, sufficiently mentioned, um, the company that uh, he represents just opened a plastic recycling facility in Italy, alongside with many other uh, plastic recycling facilities, it is for e-waste that uh, we represent via our plastic recycling branch and we work uh, and we activities uh, within URIC. And uh, just this is also a sign that the circular economy is not good for the environment and, and to, to decarbonize the economy. It also creates jobs, local jobs and industrial facilities to do things a bit differently. So that's point number one. Point number two, to build on the industrial vision of the circular economy. I think all the, 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 the panelists uh, uh, basically stressed uh, actually the same points, but from a different perspective, the need for harmonization and the need for better legislation. If we, um, again, uh, make a very short dive into the initial uh, statements that were made, better legislation means sometimes also to, to simplify the procedures. And this is absolutely essential when it comes to, to waste shipment regulation for intra EU waste shipment regulation for the different fractions of e-waste. The procedures, unfortunately, are not sufficiently harmonized. And that results in overly long, costly and burdensome procedures alongside the different actors that actually are process collecting, sorting and recycling uh, the different fractions that are being found in e-waste. And this is overly important bit when it comes to the recycling of base metal plastics or the critical raw materials that are going to become rightly and legitimately a, a new priority at European level. And this is really why I hope to continue being able to work with the policymakers between the Parliament, the Council and the Commission 
to, to make sure that we are not going to have unintended consequences when it comes to strengthen the requirements for um, uh, basically the, the, the exports of um, unprocessed plastics for which we don't have anything to say on the contrary. But when it comes to the shipments, especially for intra-EU uh, 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 intra fractions from e-waste, this is absolutely essential to have clarity in uh, the, uh, the the procedures that are going to be followed, while also keeping access to international markets for uh, for fractions for which the demand in Europe is, is not sufficiently developed. Point number two, I think when it comes to harmonization enforcement was also the link uh, to make sure that there is an actual enforcement. Uh, the recycling industry at all uh, steps it has to comply with very strict rules and indeed the lack of enforcement or the insufficient enforcement in a number of member states is also an issue for the industry as a whole and for the recycling industry in particular uh, because the compliant obviously uh, players are facing uh, basically uh, activities which are not playing by the book. And I think here we need to go beyond simply looking at the rules, the standards, and also look at how basically they are going to be enforced in practice to make sure uh, that uh, this is being diminished uh, at the lowest uh, possible extent. Um, point number four or point number three, and this is ob obviously uh, partly linked, how to increase collection. If we want to be in a position to uh, uh, recycle more, we need to make sure that we are going to collect more and collect better uh, to make sure, especially for e-waste, that they are, the e-waste that is being collected will go to the facilities that are properly equipped to do a proper job. And thus, there will be, I think, quite some work to be done with evaluation and beyond to make sure that a collection uh, is, is, is better and is scale up at European level. Linked to that is obviously the, the, the need where I think all the players had an unanimous support to transform the directive into the regulation into a regulation. That means that the Commission will have more responsibilities to get it right because there will be less margin of implementation to, to member states. But on the other hand, if we want to build an internal market for uh, recycling and for sustainability, we need to have uh, the same rules across the EU and, and less uh, uh, differences in, in terms of implementation and enforcement. And so I think here we, we all agree. Point number four, um, uh, that was also kind of a, uh, unanimous agreement, though there was also some discrepancies in, in what are the tools to achieve that, the link between, uh, on one hand, uh, design and recycling. And here it's typically, you need both. We need to obviously have uh, state-of-the-art recycling facilities, but to be able to recycle, we need to make sure that the products that are placed on the market at first, uh, that are placed in the market, uh, are designed to, to be more sustainable. So that means during the life cycle to, to be easier to repair and that was what Maturama stressed, and when they reach end of life, to be easier to recycle. And here, a lot of the dismantling obligations to make sure that we don't glue and weld everything together without looking at the intrinsic characteristics of the materials will actually do good to both repairability and recyclability. And on the other hand, we obviously fully understand that we need to work hand in hand with producers to achieve that, uh, to make, because they, they obviously know uh, the products that are placed on the market and the desires of consumers. And so here, I think there is a real discussion to, to be made, but there is also consistency in the legislation that has to be achieved to provide the right drivers from design to recycling to the entire uh, industrial uh, value chains. And uh, that's, I think, uh, something that, uh, to, to conclude on two last points, recycled content, as, as Zurich will keep uh, pushing for recycled content for uh, materials for which there is uh, a low recycling and for which there is uh, not sufficient, I would say, uh, recycling taking place today, or where we also do want to do some industrial transformation and, for instance, uh, make sure that in Europe we have more facilities that are going to use materials from recycling instead of extracted raw materials. And thus, uh, this is, I, I understand, sometimes a chicken and the egg discussion, but if we want to be able to level the playing field, be competitive with extracted raw materials, and at the same time make sure that we design better products, um, we need obviously to have uh, recycled content targets, which are binding, which are set at pragmatic level, yet ambitious, and that again requires a strong collaboration between the, the industry, the recycling industry, the e-industry, so the electrical and electronic appliances industry, and obviously the policy makers and the NGO. And, and this is why I think here the last key and final word is, is collaboration. 
I look forward and we look forward as Zurich, whether it's our activities dealing with e-waste or e-plastics to continue the discussion with the Commission, with the GRC, with the European Parliament, especially in, in connection to the SPR and uh, with the Member States to make sure that we, we bridge uh, the objective that the EU wants to achieve to be the champions in circular and climate uh, legislation to a real industrial uh, chance for recyclers and for industries in the EU. So I'd like to thank uh, very much uh, Kira for the moderation, Ricardo Buntis, my colleague in charge of e-waste for organizing uh, such an event, all the speakers and obviously all the participants and apologies for, for, for the questions that we could not answer. Um, we will try either later or feel free to reach out to our secretariat and we'll do our best. Thank you very much and have a very nice afternoon. Bye.